Um, I was asked to speak here by one of my students, by Casey, and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. This is something that, uh, even in its existence, just well, it just makes me really happy. <laughs> it makes me just excited to be here, and I'm excited that you guys are all here. But um, I'm also acutely aware that I'm the opening act for Dr. Chomsky, um, and I'm, I'm honored um, and respectful um, of him. So I'm going to try to keep my comments fairly brief, and then um, really, I'm here to talk about the history of student activism, and as a historian, you know, I have this natural inclination to want to run through a chronology of student resistance for the last 150 years and tell you about all of these, <clears throat> excuse me, great accomplishments, but I'm not really sure that that's the purpose of this summit, and I'm not really sure that going into a bunch of details about a bunch of movements that are in some ways sort of historically specific to their time uh, is what you need, right? It is what is needed at this moment. I think that takes place on a smaller scale. Um, so even though, as I said, I, I kind of admittedly wanted to do that, and I, I do have probably more detail in here than I need, I want to talk more about the condition of student activism and the historical tradition of student activism, because the idea of student has really, over a long course of time, the idea of being a student empowered young people to make claims against the state that they might not otherwise have made. And they've come together under this identity and this banner of student across the globe and across time in part of a shared tradition. And so that's what I want to sort of focus on today. And I'm going to try to stay close to my notes, which I'm not very good at doing. Um, so I think that where I begin and where I began in my preparations for this is really this question of what makes a student particularly uh, so well positioned to organize. Um, and I think that there's a lot of answers to that question. I think everyone in this room probably has to some degree a slightly different answer to that question on an individual level. But if we historicize this and we look at this larger pattern of student resistance and this larger tradition globally of student resistance, we can see certain commonalities that make us understand ourselves a little better, but also make us understand what we're doing and the entire collectivity of this a little greater and a little broader. And I think one of the major ideas that we see in student activism is an inherent hopefulness in education. So education in of itself is, and getting an education is a hopeful activity, and it's an asking for more. When you're going to get an education and when you're receiving an education, it's because you want to know more. You want more information. You want to understand more, and you want to see things in a new way. And this hunger that's inherent in education, and I understand that every time a student is sitting in a lecture hall, they're not, you know, hungry for more education. But at its heart, it really is, right? This is what this is why you choose to become a student, because you want you want more. And I also think that you know, the idea behind an education, you're told this over and over and over as a student, is that you're being prepared for the future, right? So, you know, oh, you're the next generation and the future is yours. So well, really, why not uh, make that future one in which you want to live? And in such, you know, being a student is often a time of political awakening for, for young people. It's a transition from being the child of your parents to a citizen of the state in a lot of ways, right? And you're, you're looking at your role as a citizen of the state, not just... Uh, you know, it's, it's different. It's different when you're in primary or, or lower education because you're still under the, the guise of, of being cared for. At a university or a college level, you're, you're becoming more of a free agent, so to speak. And this is a really transitional period, and it's, it's a transitional period that others have noticed long before you and I. And um, I really like a quote that I'm going to read to you from 1966, The Poverty of Student Life. And The Poverty of Student Life was written by some, many of you have hopefully probably read this. Um, it was written by Strasbourg students that came together and offered a real critique of their situation. Um, but while they were talking about themselves, let's, let's consider might they be talking about us as well. And so they said, I quote, Modern capitalism and its spectacle allot everyone a specific role in, general in a general passivity. The student is no exception to the rule. He has a provisional part to play, a rehearsal for his final role as an element in market society as conservative as the rest. The student leaves a leads a double life, poised between his present status and his future role." End quote. 
Now that's kind of negative. Don't worry, it does get more hopeful later for them. Um, but but the, I think the duality of your role as a student is captured really well here. Um, and your position to move forward um, is, is captured well. Now a little more positively, and in fact earlier, um, again I'm a historian so I've got to pull quotes for you guys. Um, in 1962 here in the United States, Students for a Democratic Society issued the Port Huron Statement. This is of course a landmark document in the creation and articulation of the new left, um, something that really is uh, in many ways the root or, or one of the many roots of what we're doing here today, right? That this sort of open democracy is a uh, direct outgrowth of many of these new left ideas. And in the opening of their statement, they say, introduction, I'm quoting, agenda for a generation. We are people of this generation, bred in at least modern comfort, housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit, end quote. And here we see, again, they get more positive and more, and more direct as they go on as well, but we see this, this sort of precipice that students are standing on, this, this moment of, you know, we're now at a point where we can see issues, we can see problems, and we're actually in a position to make changes, right? And we can't necessarily rely on those that came before us to have solved all of these problems, because in fact they may have contributed to them. Um, and the point in drawing out these quotes, I guess, um, for me as a historian, is that, you know, I, I suspect that most of us can relate to the sentiments that I just read, but these were written in the 60s, right? But the, the condition of the student and the state of the student um, and this position, this precipice of the student is something that we've all shared, that we've all felt and experienced. Um, and it's something that really roots and guides what, what's happening here today. So it doesn't mean that you have to be a student to want to change the future, right? And nor are students somehow, uh, just to be clear, um, especially qualified to do this over their non-student counterparts. But on a practical level, again, this is sort of in a, a historical tradition, being a student at a university or a college or a community college or another educational institution puts you in direct and immediate contact with other people in the same position, right? There's a physicality of the campus. There's a physicality of your community that puts you all together. And the physicality of that and the location of that makes for great conditions for collective action. And this, again, is an example today. So the student identity has a historical tradition. And you know, student activists of each generation, they know that students before them have come together and acted collectively, right? And that itself, this knowledge that this is a historical tradition, is itself a key to mobilization, right? So knowing that students have come together in the past and made changes, and here you are now a student, and you are coming together, that's motivating, and it's mobilizing. And you know this historical tradition, which again is long and diverse and globally spread out, more global than uh, many, many other phenomenons that we call global, um, it inspires us and also offers us lessons. And we can look back at prior mobilizations and prior efforts, and we can see what worked, right? And, and does that mean it's going to work for us now? No, it might not. We have our own conditions, right? Uh, in, in as much as we learn from the past, so too do the powers that be, right? Anybody that's been to a, a, a protest in the last 10 years is aware that the state has figured out how to manage protesters. Um, but in, you know, we can also see what didn't work, and we can see mistakes that were made. We can see divisions that were made. We can see insensitivities that were, not, that were not cared for. We can see how people harmed each other when they meant to hurt each other. And these are all important lessons that we can learn from each other and from, uh, from people that have done this before. So, uh, you know, in terms of successes and mistakes, I guess, uh, before I move away from this, I just want to say that this, this historical tradition, in a way, I mean, sometimes we don't think in these terms, but it's also really validating, right? So the question is, what do these dumb students know about the world, right? They're just a bunch of kids, right? They should just let us handle it. They, they need to get an education. Well, this is as much a part of education as anything else. What you're doing here is probably fundamental to your education as a citizen to the state. I would argue foundational to your education as a citizen of the state. Um, so I think that looking back and saying, you know what, we do have a right 
as students to come together. And we are valid in asking and, and for these things and making these claims. That's engaging with a historical tradition. And that's using this historical tradition uh, in, in a way that, that history is great, right? In, in, in what history is for. We should learn from it and we should be empowered by it. Um, so again, you know, I guess I'm, I'm jumping a bit. But you know, one of the things that I think makes students particularly keen to organize um, and in some ways is why we can look back at this tradition and see a lot of similar causes across space and time. As someone who works outside, uh, regionally I work outside the United States, and it's always amazing to me how many of the issues that students in, you know, 1975 Bangladesh were talking about, uh, you know, the same issues that I was talking about when I was in, uh, you know, an undergrad myself in, you know, last year, not really, I'm not that young, but I like to pretend that I'm still younger than I am. Uh, but the point is that these are shared issues across time, right? Um, and one of the reasons is that college campuses and university campuses are often little microcosms of larger society, right? You have a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds that often come together. And so you can start to see problems and issues and, and positives as well in kind of a sharp relief, right? It's a focus in. It's a, it's a, it's a distilling. So some of the examples is when you have a rape culture on campus or you're encountering rape culture on campus, this isn't something that exists only on your campus, right? This is a reflection of larger problems in society, of sexism in society, of a tolerance for misogyny in society. And so you see it on your campus, it's immediate, it's stark, it's in front of you, and you're able to extrapolate and you're able to expand it, right? Um, I think another example, and I think Dr. Chomsky will probably uh, bring this issue up uh, in more detail is this corporatization that's taking place on the campuses. Um, and we can see this as a reflection of the larger problems of capitalist g greed generally and the bloated power of multinational corporations in virtually every aspect of society. Um, <laughs> So students are in a position, both personally as individuals, collectively as a social role, to see issues that they want to address and to imagine ways that these issues could be addressed. And so I think those are two examples, but I, I want to give a little bit more specifically of how it's really easy to start with campus issues or even shared campus issues and connect those and draw those into larger social issues. Um, and so for example, when students in South Africa in the 1960s formed the National Student Union of South Africa, uh, their opening goal, their mission, was to desegregate the campus. Um, now, obviously, this is, one would argue, a campus issue on some level, right? They're talking about the policy on their campus of desegregation. But clearly, this is linked and part of the larger struggle to end apartheid in South Africa, the struggle that took decades. Uh, and then later, much later, in fact, decades later, when students in the United States and many at universities that are represented here today by you came together and organized and mobilized and protested for their universities to divest funds from South Africa, uh, they were taking part in that same struggle, right, to end apartheid. And ultimately, uh, this, the larger struggle and strategy of opposing apartheid works and, and the policy, at least on a, on a policy level, is, is ended. But what's important is that separated by space and time, students here in the United States, in the Northeast in, in, in particular, uh, and students in South Africa, you know, decades prior, all mobilized this student identity for this larger cause, right? This student identity gave them what they needed to make a change to end this policy. And in another vein, I guess, but similarly, um, what, what starts as students or starts as campus issues often escalates when students join up with other constituencies. And this is an aspect that I guess I would want to emphasize a, a great deal because I think that solidarity and, and working with constituencies outside of the student identity is fundamental. Um, and so a, a good historical example is, of course, 1968 in Paris. This is one of the sort of most famous um, uprisings of the 1968s. Um, students take over the university, they occupy it, it gets lots of attention, but when does it really get serious? Well, it gets serious when the workers join them and they have a general strike. And they essentially shut down Paris, right? They almost bring the de Gaulle government, which was a horrible government, uh, to collapse. Ultimately, they don't. Um, but what they are successful in doing is, is 
creating such a spectacle and creating such a fear in not only the French government, but governments all over, that people see the power of students and workers coming together, right? And 1968 and 1969 globally explodes in movements. And in terms of worker-student collaboration, the 68s, as we call them, they don't all take place in the year 68, are phenomenal examples of students and workers finding common ground and realizing that they're working on the same issues. So we have uprisings as widespread as the United States, Pakistan, Germany, London, Mexico City, Cairo, Istanbul, Rio de Janeiro, you really, I mean, I couldn't even list off how many of these uh, mobilizations occur. And many of this is sort of, many of these are inspired by the May 68s, but, but, or the Paris May 68, but it's also more of just a generalized realization, right? I mean, uh, George Katsiafikas, who's a scholar of 68, you know, calls this in, in a sense a zeitgeist that, that takes place. It's this magic moment. Uh, where everyone realizes that, that this is a possibility. Well, I don't think it's a magic moment, right? I mean, it may have been a historical convergence, but this could be a magic moment just as easily. It just takes noticing it. It just takes realizing it and deciding to act. Um, so th this, this link between workers and students, I guess I just, I'm going to harp on this for a minute, uh, because it's a genuinely powerful alliance. And it's one that really cannot be underestimated in terms of political, economic, and social power. And it's one that generally, in terms of state power, and even university administration power, is incredibly terrifying, right? Because it's a real threat. Um, so another example of the alliance that I, I think is a really important one and, and illust illustrative um, is that when 100,000 100, students gathered in Tiananmen Square in 1989 to call for democratic opening uh, in China, not a lot happened actually initially. It was 100,000 students, which is a lot, but there wasn't a huge state response. When over a million workers and residents joined with those students, it hit the fan, right? The government responded tragically and violently, but, and it was brutal, and, and, and in some ways you could argue that they, that they were defeated, but they weren't defeated, right? There's a historical twist to this, because we remember 1989 in China today, and most of you know what I'm talking about uh, when, in Tiananmen Square, and we remember that as a student protest, but only about a tenth of the people there were students, right? The students were the vanguard. The students were there first. But this is an example of how this sort of student identity is, is latched onto this. One of the reasons it's latched on is because in terms of media power, seeing students getting gunned down and beat down by the authorities is enormously strategically effective for a movement to emphasize or to show, right? Um, and that's something that, um, you know, the power of a nonviolent protester being beaten down by a violent state, and particularly a young, optimistic, youthful student being, I'm not encouraging you to all go get beat down, I'm just pointing out, <laughs> that, that, you know, the image, this is something that has been strategically deployed. This was employed in the decolonization movements. This was employed in the American Civil Rights Movement. Um, you, you force the state to show its violence, right? You force the violence in the system to the surface, and they can't deny it, right? If they're, if they're beating kids down in the street, they can't deny that their power is being enforced uh, through force. Um, so, uh, you know, the, this worker-student alliance, I guess I just am emphasizing, um, well, partly because it's my thing, but, um, the, you know, I guess to sum that up, the past has lessons, but I also want to emphasize that it's not some kind of perfect model. Um, so, I, you know, I use this phrase a lot, and you know, I have some students here that have probably heard me say it before. You know, the past offers us lex lessons, but not dogma. So it's really, as a young person that is participating uh, in this movement now, it's perfectly acceptable and, and good for you to be critical of movements that have come before you, and for you to say, yeah, I know that's the way you guys did it, and I know it worked for you, but that's not necessarily what's working for us now, right? Um, and so I think that, that approaching the past with one that says we're willing to learn from this, but we're not just going to, you know, it's not such a checklist that we're going to fill out. First, we hold this summit, and then we're going to hold a march, and then we're going to have, and we're going to, you know, I don't even know what comes after that. I think that's as far as the model goes often. So, because if the model went any further, we wouldn't need this summit, right? We'd be done. Um, but so I think that um, 
when we look at history and the great tradition of student activism around the world, we learn from that experience of the past. Um, but it's also important that we remember that this movement has to look forward and at the present. Um, and every era, including our own, has its own historical specificity and new conditions that, that you have to address, and also new strategies that are available to you. I was just speaking with, with students of my own about how, you know, I, I'm not that old, and I remember in 1999 um, being so excited by the existence of indie media to find out what was happening uh, in Seattle. Well, that was 99, that's not that long ago, and it was earth-shaking, right, that you could know what was happening in this protest as it was happening, now that's a given, right? That's, that's like, you know, it's in the water, it's, it's fluoride. We expect to know what's happening in protests around the world. Um, and that's a huge benefit and that's a huge power uh, that, that we have, that, um, that we can use to our advantage. Um, and so uh, I would also like to just make a final point uh, as I wrap this up about the campus community itself. And, and, and maybe this is a little self-serving uh, since I'm no longer an undergraduate student, but I want to point out that, you know, it's not just undergraduate students that are sharing in this goal. Um, and so really faculty, campus workers, graduate, undergraduate students, we're kind of all on the same side. And one in particular on campus issues, um, you know, as an educator myself, I don't really know any professors or educators, and I suspect Dr. Chomsky can back me up on this, that went into academia or went into becoming an educator because we wanted to make the university administration a lot of money. It's just that really isn't what motivates us. It's not what motivates us to stay up till 4 a.m. writing a lecture, right? Not that we aren't all as prepared as you always are. Um, but we're there because we're taking part in the academy. We're taking part in this quest for knowledge, right? We want to share ideas, and we, and we do see it by and large, most of my colleagues see this as a back and forth. And we see your education and your right to education and our right to give you an education and our right to talk about ideas um, as something that usually is only being interrupted by some sort of administrative policy, right? Um, so, you know, we treat, edu uh, well, okay, so I'll put this into my analytical terms. If we look at the university administration in terms of a class system, the administration is the owning class. This is what they are. They own the money and they own the purse strings, and they, they, that's who they are. And, you know, we don't have anything in common with them. And they know that. They know it very well. Now, on an individual level, have you met an administrator and you think, oh, yeah, we both like, you know, Bob Dylan, so great, we have everything in common. That's not what I mean. Our position vis-a-vis -vis what we're doing at that institution, we have nothing in common. The administration is not there uh, with the same goal as us. But, and they know that, and we need to know that. What they also know is that what we, faculty, graduate students, undergraduate students, all have in common is that we have nothing in common with them. Right? And I'm not trying to create an antagonism, but if their goal is to get as much money out of each student, then you don't have anything in common. You're on the other side of the aisle from that issue, right? They're trying to squeeze money out of you. And what's really terrifying to them is that if we, workers, students, faculties, if all of us who have in common that we have nothing in common with them were to come together into one single constituency, Imagine if all of the people they were trying to squeeze money out of came together and said, could you stop squeezing money out of us, seriously? Uh, they know that they would be completely powerless in the face of that. Um, and so just to illustrate, I'd like to point out that when the university cuts library workers, which we know, here we are on the Harvard campus, um, it's cutting academic resources for students, right? So you may not know anybody who works in the library, but your library is not going to be as functional because they've cut workers. When it cuts security jobs, it makes your campus less safe. When it increases class sizes, it makes it harder for faculty to teach classes. When they jack up tuition, they make education less available for working class students. When they hire adjunct instructors instead of tenure track positions at less than minimum wage, they make the quality of your class experience less because you have adjunct instructors that are trying to teach five or six classes just to put bread on the table. Uh, when they cut ethnic studies programs, make contraceptives unavailable, sweep reports of rape and sexual assault under the carpet so they aren't deemed an unsafe campus, 
Uh, when they tell students that it isn't the school's fault that they have 100 grand in student loan debt when they graduate, uh, when they pay janitors a fifth of what one student pays a year in tuition, it's all an attack on everybody. It's all an attack on the shared goal. Uh, and it's all part of the scheme where these administrations are getting rich, and we're all paying for it together. So it's to their advantage when we say students and workers don't have anything in common. It's to their advantage when they say, oh, you know, it's not our fault that your, that your class is dis dissatisfactory. It's the faculty's fault, right? Um, no, it's all to their advantage when we fight amongst ourselves. And I would argue that's, that's really something that we can all apply to the left in general. We fight each other when we really don't need to be fighting each other. So in conclusion, what to do? I like to try and end things on the positive. Um, I'm not always great at doing that, but I'm going to. Uh, so, you know, I, I have to say, I think that you're, the question is where do we go from here? Well, you're already doing so much, right? You're already here now, and that's significant, and that's, that's more than so many others are doing, and it's, it's really leading the way for others to join you. But you can do things in small scales too, right? When you guys have classes, you can't do this every weekend. There was a lot of resources and time that went into planning and organizing this event. Um, and so you can't do this every day, and this can't be all that you do. Um, so I really encourage you to think in small scales also, because collective action takes place in multiple scales, and some of it takes place at the individual and small group level. Um, so I mean, one of my big uh, calls to action is often to educate yourself beyond the syllabus. Form reading groups. I am a strong advocate of reading groups. Talk, talk, talk to each other. Form cross-campus reading groups, right? So read with people from other universities. Look at what they're learning. Look at what they're talking about. Listen to what their problems are, right? So much of the feminist movement in the United States was built on women getting together and talking about their problems, right? Do this. Recreate this. This is an example of a lesson uh, that you can re recreate. Ask questions of people that have done this sort of thing before, right? Listen to their stories. Hear what worked. Hear what didn't work. Um, and finally, I, I want to encourage you uh, to, to sort of consider that you are creating your own stories and to record those for others that are going to come after you, right? So document yourselves. Document what you're doing here now. Um, recognize and celebrate that you're not only learning and participating in the immediate goals, but you're participating in this great worldwide tradition of students working together to make the world better. You know, 50 years from now, I hope that someone will be standing in my position, oh, maybe not because you'll have solved the world's problems, but you, someone will be standing in some position uh, and they'll be saying, you know, in 2012, Boston Occupy Student Summit came together and they launched a new program and it was the beginning of a new wave that ultimately led to the destruction of capitalism or, like I said, if I'm hoping, right? <laughs> Um, and, he, and, and they'll say, and they'll stand in my position, and they'll say, this is what they said. This is what they thought. Because those records were made available to them. Because those words are made available. Um, so that's sort of where I'll end it on our, our future destruction of capitalism. Um, I do want to make, before we transition over to um, my fellow worker Chomsky, um, I do want to make a shout out to the table in the lobby for the IWW, who is organizing on the same platform that I have talked about, that we as education workers, students, instructors, graduate students, any one working in a capacity with education, we have the shared goal, we should have the shared platform, we should have the shared union. So um, I encourage you to stop by their table on your way out. Um, and I thank you for your time. Well, I'd, I'd much prefer to leave as much time as possible for discussion, so I'll Try not to be too long. Uh, don't really have anything particular planned. There's lots of topics that could be discussed. I'll start by picking up on a couple of things that Sam said. So she mentioned that uh, the South African students' movement, when it began, was committed not just to student issues, but to the larger goal of uh, ending a apartheid, a major problem in the society, crucial problem. And that brings up something that's always true. That whatever's going on in the universities is uh, closely interrelated to um, socioeconomic, uh, political, other developments in the larger society. And uh, we can bring that right to here. So where you guys are sitting now is where I was sitting 60 years ago. Same hall, same seats. Didn't look as fancy then. 
And uh, at that point, there was a very serious problem of apartheid in uh, uh, multiple problems in universities like Harvard. Uh, for one thing, there were no women, and of course, no minorities. But uh, my wife was a student at the women's college, but if she wanted to get a book, say, from Lamont Library next door, uh, I had to get it for her. Uh, the uh, uh, change, uh, act activism over the years, particularly in the 60s, made a very big difference in the nature of the universities. So now I presume Harvard's probably about half women. Most colleges are. Uh, the other kind of apartheid remains uh, very significantly. Uh, and, and these are, of course, changes in the larger society. Uh, the manner of the type of education. Harvard at that time was kind of a gentleman's club, and that's uh, um, stress on men, and that related both to the character of the institution and uh, to the nature of what was taught, and that again was true uh, throughout the uh, elite universities, the Ivy League universities. Uh, so for example, my wife and I had both come from another Ivy League university, University of Pennsylvania, also with a separate women's college. And when my wife was a, a freshman at the college, the first thing that all women had to do was to take a course on what was called orientation, where they learned the important things for women to know, like uh, how to uh, uh, hold a teacup and sit on the floor with, and then stand up again without spilling it which is pretty tricky when you're wearing a dress particularly. <laughs> but uh, that was women's education. Well, that's gone. There have been a lot of changes, a lot of victories in uh, uh, changing the nature of the educational system. There's also been a lot of regression. Now, if you look over the, the, uh, the uh, trajectory that the progress in regression has taken, it reflects very much things that have been going on in the larger society and can influence them. So the, uh, the 1950s, early post-war period, was a, a pretty radical period in American life. Uh, a large percentage of the population, for example, uh, thought that uh, workers ought to own and run their own factories. Uh, and uh, what the, the wartime experience, uh, depression and the war, had a very had a radicalizing effect uh, all, over the, all over the world, in fact. Uh, it's not the kind of thing you usually study, but uh, when the American and British troops carried out what's called liberating Europe, uh, which we celebrate and in some ways should celebrate, but there were other aspects of it which weren't so pretty. So the first thing they had to do, their primary task, was to destroy the anti-fascist resistance. Uh, the anti-fascist resistance was worker and peasant based and pretty radical, a kind of ra spirit of radical democracy. And that had to be demolished. So as American and British troops moved up the Italian peninsula, the first move into the, uh, in, into the, you know, the, the mainland, they, uh, they had to dismantle the resistance, uh, the um, resistance movements and what they had established. Like in Northern Italy, they'd basically taken it over. It was worker and peasant run, uh, worker managed uh, factories and so on. And the British and Americans were not gonna tolerate that. Remember, these were liberal administrations. It was a labor government in England and liberal Democrats here, but that wasn't gonna be tolerated. So that was all dismantled and uh, the traditional order was reestablished, including fascist collaborators. Uh, same, same thing happened in Greece, but much worse. Uh, in Greece, it just ended up being a massacre. Uh, maybe 150,000 people killed. And similar actions were taken throughout the areas that were conquered. Uh, something similar happened here. Uh, right after the war, there was a ma uh, the business world was scandalized by the radicalization of the 40s and the 50, the 30s and the 40s, which was changing, a, appeared to be changing a long tradition of business domination. And they set in motion major programs to try to beat back these uh, popular uh, 
uh, movements, and uh, uh, it, it continues right up to this moment. The last 30 years have been a new phase in effort to try to drive, drive out the, the attitudes, these opinions, the beliefs, the structures that were uh, democratizing the society. There's been a major attack on uh, democracy and freedom, particularly uh, the, the 60s were, were a break. The 60s uh, did civilize the society in a lot of ways. Uh, one I mentioned, uh, bringing women more or less into mainstream society. Uh, you might remember that as late as 1975, uh, women still didn't have the guaranteed right even to serve on juries. Uh, that's uh, uh, lots of changes have taken place, a lot of it through student activism. Uh, but uh, uh, there was an immediate move made right after the 60s to beat back this new wave, and it's across the spectrum. A lot of it had to do with universities. Uh, that was, uh, if you haven't done it yet, I'd urge you to read some of the uh, documents from the period. So in the early 1970s, uh, from across the spectrum, from the right to the liberal internationalist left, uh, the same, essentially the same views were expressed. The view that there's too much democracy, that people are participating too much in the political system, the so-called special interests, meaning most of the population are pressing for their rights that shouldn't be allowed, uh, and particularly that uh, there's a problem with what was called the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. That's not my phrase. That's the phrase from the liberal end of the spectrum, uh, the sector that filled the Carter administration, for example. Actually, I'm quoting a Harvard professor, uh, Samuel Huntington, who was the author of uh, 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 part of a study called The Crisis of Democracy about how to impose more moderation and democracy to uh, drive people back to passivity and obedience. You go to the right wing, it's much harsher. If you haven't done it, I'd urge you to take a look on the internet at uh, a very significant uh, memorandum by Lewis Powell. Uh, Powell was a corporate lobbyist, uh, later appointed to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon, and he wrote a very important memorandum, very influential memorandum, I think, 1971, which uh, he wrote actually to the Chamber of Commerce, the main business lobby. And what he told the Chamber of Commerce is, he said, uh, the entire free enterprise system, the basis of our liberty, is under attack. Uh, the universities, the media, the government have all been taken over, literally. He's very paranoid, but it re reflects the attitude. Uh, they've been taken over by left-wing extremists who are going to destroy our freedoms. It's a little bit like listening to Mitt Romney and the rest of them today. Uh, the only choices, he said, are between freedom, free enterprise, or bureaucratic regulation of our lives by the state. And they're winning. They've taken over everything. Uh, they're destroying free enterprise. He said the uh, businessmen, he said, are the group that have the least influence in the country on government, on the economy, and everything else. And he said, we've got to do something to mobilize. And the core part was the universities, the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Uh, he said, after all, we, the business world, have the resources. Uh, we have the money. You know, we fund them. Uh, we pay them. We're the, what's now called job creators, you know, I mean, profit <laughs> creators. And so we have the money. So we've got to mobilize and organize and do something about it. And right at that point, this kind of common uh, 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 conception across the spectrum uh, did lead to many significant changes, uh, which you're living in right now. So take, say, student debt. Uh, debt is now, as you probably know, over, over a trillion dollars. That's more than credit card debt. That's phenomenal. Well, that's a crucial way of uh, dealing with the failure of the institutions responsible for indoctrination of the young. You come out of college with a heavy debt, uh, you're trapped. That's the rest of your life. Uh, maybe you wanted to be a 
say, a public interest lawyer when you went into Harvard, but uh, uh, you come out with tens of thousands of dollars of debt, you're just going to have to go into a corporation to pay off your debt, you get trapped in the corporate culture, it's the end of that. Uh, and it generalizes, it's supposed to generalize across the society. Uh, very, that's the point at that time, in fact, early 70s, when debt started to, when college tuition started to go through the roof. Now, by now, it's outlandish. Uh, just to, and it, it is incidentally not an economic necessity. That's very easy to see. So our own country, our own society in the 1950s, that's the period of the greatest uh, growth, 50s and 60s, the greatest economic growth in history, a very successful period. Education wasn't entirely free, but it was fairly free. So when I went to college in 1945, the University of Pennsylvania, it was $100 a year, which was you know, a lot of money for working students, which we were, but you could very easily get a scholarship to pay it and work on the side. You could make out, but not like now. Uh, the, uh, and for, for uh, the GI Bill was passed, and that brought a huge number of students who would never have been able to get into college, enabled them to go to college free. And that was a major, con a big effect on their lives, of course, but also a major uh, spur to the development of the society. It's part of the reason why the 50s and the 60s were such a uh, successful growth period. Uh, furthermore, if you look at other countries, uh, you can see clearly that it's not an economic necessity. So go across the border to Mexico. That's a poor country. They have, it's not like us, richest country in the world. Uh, they have quite a respectable higher education system. Uh, UNAM University, of, I lectured, lectured there a couple of times. Very high standards, lively student body, rotten salaries, of course, uh, but reasonable facilities, you know, not big sports stadiums and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it's free. And there's a reason why it's free. Uh, about 10 years ago, the government tried to institute a small tuition. There was a national student strike across the country. It beat it back, uh, still free. In fact, one of the main administration buildings on the UNAM campus is still occupied. It's become a kind of an activist center on campus. Uh, this kind of thing, incidentally, is going on all over the continent now. Uh, in Chile, there have been major student strikes for almost a year now, uh, which have become national strikes, uh, which are aiming to uh, uh, undermine the, uh, the system <clears throat> of the, the system of education that was imposed by the Pinochet dictatorship, which we installed back in 1973 which created basically a sharply two-tiered educational system, education for the rich, uh, nothing, very little for anyone else. Uh, that's been very effective. It's spreading through the hemisphere. And in places like Mexico, it persists. In fact, it's more than that. Uh, Mexico had a left-wing mayor, Mexico City, uh, a couple of years ago. And he established a, uh, a university on, in the city, which is not only free, but is open admissions. Uh, so anybody can go. They have compensatory courses for people who have to you know, have a little back, more background than they got out of school. And it's pretty good. I, I lectured there too, met students and teachers, fairly high standards. Uh, the point is these are not uh, economic issues. Uh, same is true in rich countries, like Germany is a rich country. Education's free. Uh, and as I say here, it was not free, but very low pay, except for you know the gentlemen's club uh, back in uh, uh, not very long ago, 50s and 60s. Well, uh, 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 but these but these are effective techniques of indoctrination. Uh, you know it yourself, and there are other things like them. Uh, Sam mentioned the increasing uh, corporatization of the universities, which is part of the more general uh, growth in power of corporate institutions. Uh, in the uh, society altogether, not that they weren't there before, they were the dominant force in the society for well over a century, but there's been a big change in the last 30 years. Uh, it's the change that's 
symbolized by the uh, Occupy slogan, which is now taken over everywhere, 99%, 1%. The last 30 years, I won't go through the details because you know them, uh, there's been virtual stagnation or decline for the majority of the population. Uh, plenty of wealth generated, but going into mostly a fraction of 1% of the population, the financial institutions, uh, hedge fund managers, and so on. Those are big changes in the society. Uh, uh, they're by no means necessary. In fact, there's a good uh, monograph that just came out about it. If you haven't seen it, you might take a look. Uh, put out by the Economic Policy Institute. They're the main monitor of sort of data on the state of work in America. It's called Failure by Design. And the phrase by design is crucial. They're talking about what's reviewing what's happened in the last 30 years, you know, all the data and statistics, which most of you know. And they point out it is by design. There's, it's not required by economic principles uh, and inter international integration, so-called globalization, uh, doesn't require this, technology doesn't. It's very explicit planning and design to create a certain kind of society, uh, namely one which is sharply two-tiered. Uh, of course, in the interest of the designers, it's not a failure for them, they're doing fine. Uh, and it reaches the universities uh, in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, uh, funding was uh, uh, from the state or, or from uh, state institutions. So down the street at MIT, where I am and was since the mid-50s, uh, funding was almost entirely from the government, federal government, uh, through the Pentagon, incidentally. The Pentagon funded almost the entire university uh, up until the 1970s. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. The Pentagon is a funnel designed to take taxpayer money and turn it into the uh, next phase of the high-tech economy. So, for example, at MIT there was no war work done on campus, almost entirely Pentagon funded. But it was developing things you now take for granted, uh, the internet, uh, computers, microelectronics, uh, the, the whole IT revolution, basically state created. You know, people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs uh, cherry pick from the results of public funding and commercialize it and you know, become big heroes and very rich, of course. Uh, but most of the, of the uh, funding comes from the public. It's, it was done through the Pentagon because that's the way you can get taxpayers to pay for it. You have to frighten them. You tell them it's a standard technique of control. Frighten people. Then they'll huddle under the umbrella of power. So the Russians are coming, the Chinese are coming, you know, whoever it may be, the drug peddlers, uh, aliens, whatever it may be. And uh, people are frightened. It's a very frightened society. It's worked, unfortunately. Uh, in those days, it worked to take public funds and turn them into eventually uh, profits for Microsoft, Apple, uh, you know, and so on, and uh, objects that people like, like uh, iPhones and Internet, useful products. Uh, in the 1970s, that began to change. Uh, Pentagon funding declined, and funding from the... Uh, health-related parts of the federal government, National Institute of Health and others, increased. There's a reason. The economy was changing. Uh, the cutting edge of the economy was changing from electronics-based to biology-based, and therefore the taxpayer has to fund the next phase of the uh, advanced economy by a different means. Uh, not because the Russians are coming, but uh, because we're going to your cancer or something. And meanwhile, you do biotechnology and genetic engineering and whatever the next phase of the economy will be. Well, that's the way this is. And a, another uh, component in the last 30 years has been corporate funding. And that has a very interesting effect. So again, let me just take MIT. I know it best, and it's right here. Uh, uh, corporate funding has uh, multiple effects. For one thing, it, uh, the, f the federal funding, say the Pentagon, 
uh, basically doesn't care what you do. They're the best funders that exist. They just do your work. And incidentally, they don't care what you do politically either. So while in the 60s, uh, MIT was about 90% Pentagon funded, and uh, the lab where I, that I was in was 100% Pentagon funded, it was also the academic center of, ac of anti-war resistance. Not protest, but resistance. Uh, they basically didn't care. If you want to overthrow the government, that's your business, as long as you're doing your work. But uh, when it moves to corporate funding, it goes towards short-term profits. I mean, the Pentagon or the National Institute of Health or the government generally, uh, they're trying to uh, develop the advanced economy across the board, uh, not because they love advanced technology, but that's where profit comes from uh, in the next phase. A corporation is trying to fund something for itself, uh, not for the, not for the uh, uh, general you know, economy. So they want something, and they want it short term, not for 30 years from now. Like, you know, the internet, for example, was in the state sector for about 30 years before it was privatized. Uh, computers were, digital computers were getting built in the early 50s. And it wasn't until around 1980 that they became commercially viable and, you know, Apple and IBM could make some profit out of them. Uh, but uh, the corporations want short-term benefits, and they want uh, it for themselves, not for others. So that's a big effect on, uh, uh, furthermore, they, they, they want secrecy. The Pentagon didn't care about secrecy. So in fact, there was no secrecy on campus, no classified work. Now, corporations can't order secrecy, but they have ways of imposing it. For example, they can threaten not to renew a contract. Well, that has an effect that has the desired effect. People don't talk. In fact, the, the scandals have come serious enough to make the front page of the Wall Street Journal from secrecy at MIT. You know, students refusing to answer questions on exams uh, because they're bound by uh, a contract that their professor has not to release information that they know, so they can't answer the question. Uh, th th uh, there's also uh, a, 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 a corporate culture becomes imposed on the university. That's the basis for what Sam was talking about. There's been a sharp <coughs> increase in the proportion of administrators relative to faculty and students. The number of administrators has shot up as all over the country, incidentally. Layer after layer of administration, uh, far beyond, very much like corporate culture. Uh, decisions over running the university, it used to be pretty much faculty, and now it's administration faculty. Uh, and uh, also other aspects of corporate culture that are introduced are uh, what's called efficiency. Efficiency is, it's called an economic notion, but that's highly misleading. It's an ideological notion. So for example, if uh, say a, a business sheds employees, like say an airline, uh, and uh, uh, you want to uh, get a ticket for something or other, uh, when you talk to a person, it's a, it works, but it's inefficient because they have to pay more. If you call up and you get a menu and you sit there for half an hour uh, while a voice says, uh, Thank you. You know we love your business. Uh, hang on, uh, and finally you get something that isn't what you wanted. So you have to try something else. Uh, you've all had this kind of experience all over the place. Economists don't call that a cost uh, because it's transferred to people, and things that are transferred to people aren't costs. But it's uh, efficient for the uh, for the business, and uh, that corporate culture goes to the universities and reaches what Sam was talking about. Uh, you cut back, you increase the number of administrators, uh, cut back class size, uh, use uh, cheap, temporary, uh, easily exploitable labor, what's called graduate students, to teach uh, <laughs> courses. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, all of these things have a cost, but the cost is transferred to students, to faculty, to just people. And it saves uh, 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 it, 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 it's efficient from the point of view of the funders, the people who Justice Powell was talking about, 
uh, the businessmen who uh, essentially fund the university. Uh, we've now reached a stage where public education is practically disappearing. Uh, more than half the states and by now already, a uh, majority of the, uh, in the state colleges and universities, most of the funding is coming from uh, tuition because tuition is going sky high. Uh, community colleges are still funded, but it's predicted that they'll uh, disappear too and that the whole concept of publicly funding universities will disappear. The universities will be for the rich and for the rest it'll be uh, you know, vocational education so maybe you can get a job and uh, you know, that'll impose passivity, discipline, uh, and obedience. Well, these are principles that go very far back. I won't run through the history, but uh, uh, in the 19th century, uh, when the mass education system was just beginning in the United States, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote about it, and he, uh, he raised the question, why are political leaders interested in educating people? And he said, well, they have a good answer. And we have to educate them to keep them from our throats. In other words, if we let them be free and independent, they're not going to let us do to them what we are doing. And of course, that means a specific kind of education. Uh, education for passivity, obedience, discipline. It has a name now. It's called No Child Left Behind. That's essentially what it is. And it goes all the way up to the universities. Uh, who somewhat resist it, but not entirely. And you can go back even earlier. I'll finish with an earlier discussion of it by David Hume in the a century earlier, 18th century. Now take a look at his first principles of govern, government. Uh, one of the f basic principles of what he says is that he's astonished by the easiness with which the mass of the population submits to the few. And he says, this is a kind of paradox, because power is in the hands of the governed, just what you said about 68. Power is in the hands of the governed, and the only way that the rulers can maintain their control is by control of opinion and attitudes. And that's true in the most uh, free and uh, democratic society and in the most uh, military and brutal, same all the way. Power is in the hands of the governed. They have to be educated to keep them from our throats and educated in a particular way. Corporatization is one way of doing it. Uh, tuition rises to uh, make sure that the institution is responsible for the indoctrination of the young do their job is another way of doing it. And you can struggle against it and you can win. And we can see it right here. Uh, Harvard is not what it was 60 years ago when I was a student same across the country, and that's because people didn't give in to it. Um, so my question Actually, is... Actually, you may have to translate for me because I don't hear very well. Okay, okay. Yeah. My question is for you, Dr. Chomsky. Um, how do you think your concept of manufacturing consent has been used to delegitimize the Occupy movement, if you think it has at all? Hmm. Well, uh, first of all, it's not my concept. It goes back at least to David Hume. I just quoted it. And there's a, everyone understands it. Uh, everyone in power understands what Hume said. You can't really control, uh, at sometimes you can control people by force. They have an extremely violent, brutal society. But most of the time, power really is in the hands of the general population. So you have to control their attitudes and opinions. In the case of the Occupy movement, it's been kind of interesting to watch. I frankly have been a little bit surprised that uh, a lot of the coverage has been pretty sympathetic. That's been strikingly too in the, true in the business press. So the main uh, business journal in the world, the most important, significant uh, business daily, is the London Financial Times. Now you take a look at it, and this is across the ocean, so it's not right in front of them, but they've had a series of uh, quite sympathetic uh, articles about the Occupy movement. Now, of course, they choose what they like. You know, they're not talking about the effort to overthrow capitalism. You know, they pick things that they like, but they say, yeah, uh, something like that has to be done. I mean, they know, for example, they know very well 
that say the economic problems in American society are not what's on the front pages. I mean, you can read the major, uh, the world's most respected financial correspondent, Martin Wilf of the uh, London Financial Times. He says, look, it's totally crazy. The United States is completely undertaxed. Uh, the level of the ratio of taxes to uh, GDP is the lowest it's ever been, way below the Reagan administration. And of course, the rich aren't barely being taxed. He says, sure, this is obviously going to cause economic problems, but there's an obvious way to get out of it, trivially. Uh, they also understand very well that the problem of the United States, and you know, this generalized to Europe, is not a deficit problem. That may be a problem for the banks, but it's not a problem for the society. The problem for the society is joblessness. And what you need is stimulus, government stimulus to create demand and have jobs. Well, you know, when these things are brought out by the occupant, and they also understand very well that inequality, while it may be great for you know, a fraction of 1%, is terrible for the economy and the society. So when the Occupy movement puts issues like that to the fore, it actually does get picked up uh, as a resonance in even the business press. Of course, they don't like the idea that popular movements might uh, form and develop and, and you know, the, uh, communities of solidarity and mutual support, which might expand into the rest of the society and uh, have large-scale effects. They don't like that part. Uh, but the uh, reporting has been moderately sympathetic, more, more sympathetic than I would have expected, frankly. I mean, of course, there's the, uh, you know, derision and why don't you get a job and take a shower and all that kind of stuff, but uh, <laughs> that's predictable and there's been, uh, you know, you just kind of slough that stuff off. I mean, uh, I, I, I think it's an indication of the fact that, uh, you know, that, that things have been brought up, have been brought to the fore in the Occupy movements, which have a lot of resonance. And in fact, the big challenge of the uh, movement right now is to move beyond the tactics that have worked so spectacularly well and to find a way to bring the general population into this. And that's going to be a problem, serious problem. Uh, take a look, say, at this morning's New York Times. There's, a, there's an interesting study of uh, uh, a couple of interesting studies. One of them is about uh, the people who are reliant on benefit, what are called benefits, but don't but want to get the government off our backs. And it talks about their dilemmas. They get the government off our backs, they're going to starve, they're not going to get health care, but we don't want to have a government interfering with us. Uh, that's a lot of the public, incidentally. And it's an indication of the success of the, uh, if you like, manufacturing consent or control of opinion and attitudes. It's left people extremely confused. Now you take a look at, say, tea, polls of Tea Party members. Turns out they're social democrats. <laughs> Literally. They think there ought to be more government spending on education, on health, but get the government off our backs. You know, uh, There's some interesting, take a look at these, they're kind of interesting. They're against welfare. Everybody's against welfare. But they're in favor of more aid to women with dependent, ch uh, with dependent children, for example, just not welfare. Okay, that's uh, another great propaganda achievement. Uh, Reagan, in particular, succeeded in uh, developing an image of welfare, which nobody's in favor of. You know, a rich black woman uh, driven in a limousine to the welfare office by her chauffeur to pick up your hard-earned money. Well, nobody wants that. Uh, but uh, giving aid to, uh, say, disabled wi uh, widows, uh, women with uh, uh, children that can't support them, sure, we're in favor of that. Uh, and, and this runs across the board. There's another article in the Times today which is extremely illuminating. It's a poll. Uh, they, they ran a poll of uh, people's attitudes towards what are called entitlements. Okay. And the purpose of the article is to show how confused people are, which it actually does. So their conception of, you know, the the burden of uh, Social Security and Medicare is kind of like way out of 
proportion to what the facts actually are. But what is not discussed in the article, and this gets back to manufacture of consent, is the contribution of this very article towards controlling attitudes and opinions. Uh, you all know that the answers you get in a poll depend on the questions you ask. So take a look at the questions they're asking and the presuppositions, which are across the board. First presupposition is the problem is federal spending. You know, we've got this big problem of the deficit. And then second question is, well, what's causing it? Well, the, f the first problem is not a problem. Uh, that's, again, a problem for the banks. Certainly not a problem for the society. I mean, as I say, you can read that in the Financial Times. Uh, uh, Larry Summers, for, former president here, he'll tell you the same thing. It's not, that's not the problem. But that's the presupposition of the article is that's the problem. And then comes the question about what's causing the deficit. Well, they say it's, it's Medicare, uh, which is not totally false, but there's a reason for it. Medicare costs are going out of sight and will swamp the budget because we have a totally dysfunctional privatized health care system. If the United States had a health care system like other industrial societies, it's not exactly a utopian ideal, not only would there be no deficit, there'd be a surplus. But you can't raise that question. Similarly, you can't point out that a huge component of the deficit is a bloated military budget, which has nothing to do with defense, but has plenty to do with conquest. Uh, so those questions you just, you just can't ask. And then you get specific questions and you show public's confused about the data. Yeah, minor confusion on the part of the public, but a much worse confusion uh, on the, or maybe ideological commitment on the part of the opinion managers editors and writers of the New York Times and everyone else like them, you know. So manufacturing consent's going on all the time, and it's the way to organize and control people. Uh, but uh, uh, nothing novel about it. Well. Excellent. Thank you, Josh. Oh, we're going to try to field a couple questions at a time in the interest of time, just so we can get, make sure that we can accommodate all questions. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Dr. Johnson? Yep. So, Josh? Sure. Um, Dr. Chomsky, you talked about the need to um, instruct in people with, um, this concept of being obsequious and that kind of working all the way up to universities. I'm wondering if you think the trend now with the universities, especially in undergraduate education, um, where it's, it's moved from kind of the humanities and the arts to these majors and service kind of service industries, and if that isn't no, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. Maybe I'm, it was fairly lengthy. So it's it's difficult to hear the, the questions for Dr. Chomsky. So I, is it do people mind just kind of coming up and asking the question? I think that's yeah. Yeah, just but talk to the audience because mm -hmm. <laughs> both ways. Yeah. Yeah, I think other people may not be hearing the questions yeah. either. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, microphone. Sure. Um, <laughs> right, anyway, um, <laughs> Dr. Chomsky mentioned uh, the need to teach obedience and that working all the way up into the university level. And I'm wondering, and I, I bet you've noticed that humani uh, the education that you get as an undergraduate isn't the same as it was 60 years ago. It's moved from you know the humanities and the arts into these majors that feed into service industries, and I'm wondering if that kind of corporate culture in terms of what people are learning as undergraduates is related to the need to teach uh, people how to be obsequious, basically. Um, well, I think I think it varies. Uh, so in places like say Harvard and MIT, uh, the Cambridge universities, it's probably not true. Uh, because uh, you know, there's a standard joke, which you've probably all heard, that uh, at uh, Harvard they teach people how to rule the world, and at MIT they teach people how to make the world work. You know, uh, well, there's something to that, and that means you've got to train them to do it. Uh, but uh, that determines the, something about the kind of an undergraduate education you have. But if you go to most of the uh, educational system, it's going just in the direction you're describing. Uh, that's 
part of the effect of the uh, tuition rise and the lack of state funding. So take, say, the state of California. Uh, they had the greatest public education system in the world, actually. I, I happened to go from Mexico City, as I mentioned, where I was lecturing, to Berkeley, where I was going to lecture. That's from a poor country to the richest place in the world. Uh, in the richest place in the world, they're taking what had been a, quite a spectacular public education system and destroying it. Uh, the major universities, Berkeley, Los Angeles, uh, UCLA, are being essentially privatized. Uh, they're becoming Ivy League colleges. You know, huge tuitions, big endowments, uh, uh, essentially colleges for the wealthy, the privileged. And the rest of the state system, which was a great system, is being dumbed down to vocational education, to training people to, for services and so on. There's also been a tremendous appeal. The, there's another effect of the socioeconomic system. So as, as you all know, the financial institutions uh, have just grown way out of uh, any uh, relevance to a functioning economy. Uh, back in the 50s and the 60s, the big growth periods, uh, they were banks doing the kind of things banks are supposed to do in a state capitalist society. Uh, now, complicated financial manipulations, uh, uh, exotic uh, devices, uh, uh, about 40% of corporate profits before the last crash. Uh, again, Martin Wolf, as I said, the most respected financial correspondent in the world, uh, he just describes the financial institutions as uh, like larvae who attach themselves to a host and eat it out and destroy it. The host is the market system, which he, of course, applauds. And yeah, they're having that effect. Uh, but uh, one consequence is that they're drawing a tremendous amount of talent. So a lot of universities, maybe here at MIT, for example, the math department has separate sub-departments in the financial mathematics, uh, where you know, people with talented mathematicians, or quite a lot of them, are being drawn away from productive work, either creating new mathematics or new physics or whatever it'll be, uh, towards uh, figuring out how to cheat people on subprime mortgages. Uh, that has multiple harmful effects on the, econ on the society, all kinds of them. And that's happening all over, so that's drawing people away. Uh, but I think the basic thing that's happening is what you described, and that starts with kindergarten. So K-12 programs are now increasingly geared towards uh, control and obedience. I'm sure you've all experienced this. Uh, that's what No Child Left Behind means. You're studying for tests, uh, you memorize for a test, you forget it all because you didn't care about it, and uh, it's not the way to learn anything. It's been well understood. Uh, those of you who are scientists uh, and who read journals like Science, the main journal, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. Now, the last month or so, they've had a series of editorials by the uh, uh, the editor on how science education is being destroyed by uh, teaching people from you know how to uh, uh, six-year-olds to memorize what's in the periodic table. They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so they can uh, then pass a test uh, and uh, teaching them uh, you know, uh, the lists of enzymes when they don't understand what it's all about. And that's been going on actually for quite a while. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced it, but you know, I noticed it with my own children back in the 60s. I remember uh, I had a daughter um, who was studying new math in uh, what was called new math back around 1970, I guess, and it was it was kind of like a joke. The teacher they were being taught what was called set theory. Uh, the teacher didn't understand a word of it. Of course, the students understood nothing. Uh, the kids couldn't learn how to do long division. Of course, they come from families where their parents could teach them. It's a Boston suburb. But my wife went in to observe the class to see what the heck was going on. The teacher was standing there in front of the class with a text, a new math text, which was giving you a principled approach to long division of the kind that they'd like you to know in the Harvard Graduate Department of Math. 
uh, but the, she didn't understand it. The kids didn't understand it, and uh, it was a disaster. Well, I'll tell you one last story, I, and I think this is the way it works across the board. Uh, we, we had a visit from a, an old friend of mine, an Israeli logician, and uh, my daughter, who was then 10, I think, uh, was studying what they call set theory, actually Boolean algebra. And uh, uh, he was surprised because he'd been trying to teach it in more advanced uh, courses in, in Israel and they couldn't, wasn't succeeding. But she seemed to be learning it. And so she answered the questions that he asked. Like he asked, uh, if you have three objects, you know, coffee cup, uh, uh, you know, a book, uh, pencil, whatever, how many sets are there? She said, write off eight sets. I said, uh, and she listed the sets, including the null set. And then he uh, asked, uh, which set is included in all the other sets? I said, the null set. At that point, I was surprised. So I asked her, how do you know that the null set is included in all the other sets? She said, very simple. Uh, to make a set, what you do is draw braces and put the things that are in the set inside it. And if you look carefully, there's always a little space between the things you put in there. That's where the null set goes. <laughs> well, she was doing something very sensible. She was making up a physical model uh, to explain. It had absolutely nothing to do with what she was being taught, of course. But she made up a physical model that kind of got her through the exam. Well, you know, that's the way you can, you're going to be taught on a no child left behind uh, system. You memorize, you figure out things that will get you through, then you don't learn anything. You can't explore, you can't be imaginative, and uh, sure, that'll turn people into just what you described. Actually, I just came back from Arizona, and one of the things the state is doing there is, uh, and it's happening elsewhere, is to try to, uh, dis uh, what they're doing is destroying a, a very successful uh, Mexican studies program. Uh, it's, a, it, you know, it's basically occupied Mexico. That's what we had to call Arizona and New Mexico and California. Uh, but uh, and the big Mexican population, they had a very lively uh, uh, Mexican studies program. A lot of students taking it. It's enri it enriches them and everyone else. They learn things they ought to learn. The uh, you know, growth and understanding. But the state doesn't want it. Uh, they want indoctrination. And they're, they're actually getting to the point of banning books. Uh, they've banned pa Paulo Freire, for example. They've banned, uh, they even banned The Tempest, Shakespeare's Tempest, because it has too much of a kind of anti-colonial element in it. Well, that's what goes on when you try to, and it's happening here too, you know, destruction of bilingual programs and so on. It's pretty particularly dramatic there. Yeah, you know, all of these, I think, are ways to achieve what you were describing. To, for the elites, to make sure that they know how to rule the world and make the world work. Uh, but for the rest, uh, turn them into servants. Yeah. Sam, do you want to respond to that? Yeah. 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 I don't think so. I think in the essence of time, we'll sort of keep it to Dr. Dr. Chomsky. Chomsky, uh, as you probably uh, are aware, the northern uh, Basque region of Spain boasts one of the largest worker-owned cooperatives in the world, over 90,000 employees, Montreal. constituting 256 uh, different companies. Um, what can be done here in the United States to sort of uh, start that kind of parallel universe, if you will, and how can that also be employed in academia where we can actually extricate people like yourself from the administrative process and, and start to start education cooperatives that bring costs down and still get the message to, to the That's very important. He was talking about Mondragon, this huge uh, worker-owned uh, uh, big manufacturing financial community system in the Basque country in Spain. And it's a, it's a very, it's, it is everything, manufacturing, banks, schools, hospitals, communities. It's instantly not worker managed. It's not worker managed, which is a big gap and problem. Uh, so they, it's worker owned, but they pick professional managers, which means it actually functions like a capitalist institution. And that's another important step. We IWW people, you know, we don't agree with that. But it is, it is very important. And not only can it be done here, it is being done. 
so they're not so small. Uh, the, uh, especially in Ohio, uh, around Cleveland, which actually is an old labor town with you know a lot of uh, labor traditions. That's why somebody like Dennis Kucinich can be elected. Uh, around uh, Cleveland, there's a, quite a substantial uh, array of uh, worker-owned enterprises. They're not huge. It's not Mondragon, but it's a lot. And they're expanding. Actually, there's a very good book on it uh, by Gar L. Perovitz, who I think is going to be speaking here in not too distant future. Uh, and, and it can be done right here. In fact, if the Occupy movement had been around, say, a year ago, uh, there was a case that it could have helped out with, and I think there are others all the time. At one of the Boston suburbs, Taunton, uh, there was a uh, one of the, some multinational uh, it was closing down a subsidiary, uh, a pretty sophisticated manufacturing firm, uh, which is doing fine. It was profitable, but for a multinational, unless your profits are high enough, it's not worth keeping on the books. So they were going to close it down. Uh, the uh, workers, the union, which the uh, UE, which kind of a mildly lefty union, uh, they and the workers uh, wanted to buy it. Uh, if there had been enough support, it was closed. They didn't win. But if there had been community support and popular support, I think they could have won. And things like that are happening all the time. As far as educational cooperatives are concerned, there's a fundamental issue that goes back, again, to the 18th century. I won't run through the history. Who's education for? Who is it for? You know. Well, you go back to the 19th century. It was uh, working people were quite highly educated. Uh, if you want to know something about it, there's a terrific book by Jonathan Rose called, uh, I don't forget what it's called, it's about the British working classes. And it's a detailed scholarly investigation of what working people were reading in England. And it turns out, uh, you know, higher, it's, high, it's high culture. Actually, I can remember this myself. I'm old enough to remember the 30s. And my family are mostly unemployed working class. Uh, they were um, talking about uh, Shakespeare plays, you know, the latest uh, concert of the Budapest String Quartet, uh, the differences between Freud and Steckel. Uh, uh, these people never went to never went to school, not didn't even graduate elementary school, and at that time, uh, intellectual left wing intellectuals and academics, most of them around the Communist Party, were involved in worker education. So there were books like Mathematics for the Millions or uh, Hogman's or, uh, you know, J.D. Bernal, well-known scientist, was publishing general science and, and math books, quite good, good ones, and in other fields too. And this was going right into workers' education programs. It's the kind of thing that working people did. It's taken a lot of effort to drive this out of people's heads. And it, it is real effort. Uh, if you go back to the early Industrial Revolution right around here, eastern Massachusetts, uh, you know, it was normal. I mean, a, an, an Irish uh, blacksmith in Boston, if he had enough money, would hire a boy to read to him while he's working and to read classics or con you know, contemporary literature of the time. We now regard it as classics. Uh, and uh, the, the young women in the mills factory girls, they were called, bitterly condem uh, condemned the rising industrial system for a lot of reasons, but one, because it was just taking away their high culture, which was you know, turning them into automata. Uh, so it's been a long battle to try to turn people into uh, uh, obedient, passive creatures, and it's kind of like Marx's old mole that keeps coming up no matter how much you push it down. And I think it could be revived today. There's no reason why uh, working people can't participate in uh, high culture like anyone else. And this, the edu educational cooperatives would be a way of doing it, be a way of reconstructing the kinds of worker education programs that were all over the place not that long ago, 1930s. I'm here to talk about the role of leadership uh, in movements. Uh, Occupy is generally uh, regarded as uh, a leaderless movement. I, mean, I, I personally see other things. It's more of a decentralized 
uh, leadership structure. So if either one of you could talk about that. I think, well, I'm, I'm being encouraged, I think, <laughs> to respond. So, I, you know, I, I think maybe I'll make a, a sort of brief answer and if, if you want to build off of that. Um, I think that the entire concept of leadership is sort of interesting, the way that it's discussed when it comes to social movements. And I think that often movements have much less of a leadership core historically than we remember them having. Um, and if you certainly look at it on a much more individualized level in terms of ways that people participate in collective action and way that, ways that mobilizations are actually composed of individuals that are there and that participate in various scales of the movement and that identify in vari with various scales of the movement, uh, there's this, this tendency that we as, as scholars and, and, and in the media and in generally this tendency that we lean towards where we want to say, well, who's in charge here? Who was in charge of the movement? And who are the leaders, right? You know, where's the Rudy Duchka or the Martin Luther King Jr.? But, you know, how many people in the civil rights movement in the United States ever met Martin Luther King Jr.? Very few, right? And, and to say that they were following marching orders um, is absurd, right? Um, and I think that this movement is just a bit, this Occupy, I think one of the things that's been so exciting about this um, is that it's just a little bit more aware of itself in terms of, you know, it's true, we're not always in agreement and we're not always uh, following the same, even necessarily uh, motivation, right? But we have common interests and we have common goals. and. You know, the, the problem isn't within the movement. The movement has been successful. This has built solidarity. This has built collaboration. This has built cooperation. The only problem has been in trying to explain to other people who the leaders are when they want to hear who the leaders are, right? The problem hasn't been um, that there's been no leadership. Um, so that said, I mean, I guess that's the optimistic viewpoint. I do also think that, you know, there are social dynamics that happen in groups, and I think that as much as we need to not worry about um, trying to frame this in terms of communication into one where we can define leaders, we also don't want to pretend that leadership isn't happening when it is, right? Um, and so when you have, you know, core members that emerge and, and, you, ha and you feel like you, you uh, I don't know you, so please don't think I'm speaking to you. <laughs> when you feel like, I'll, I'll talk to the wall so no one feels thrown out. You feel like you can't speak up or you feel like your interest wasn't really represented you know, this is a two-way street, right? You know, collective action takes bravery. Um, and it's really hard in groups to speak out when you uh, think that, that something uh, isn't going the way that you want. On the other hand, it also takes bravery to compromise and to listen and to change your mind. Um, and a big part of cooperation, and I think a big part of Occupy's success, rests in people being able to change, being willing to change their minds, and being willing to listen, and saying, you know, I came into this GA thinking that this was the right direction, um, but instead of just waiting for my turn to argue my point, waiting for, for my turn to present my position, I'm really using this as a place of communication. Um, and that's leadership, right? Listening to someone else is really what leadership is. Listening and, and coming together is leadership. So. Sometimes, I mean, I know you have a media reality and you have to, uh, you have to think in terms of leadership and you have to think in terms of, of almost marketing campaigns sometimes, right? Um, but, you know, Occupy and, and this generation has rejected a lot of norms. Um, and, and who says we can't reject leadership norms too, right? We're all leaders. I think that that, that works if you really believe it. So do you want to add on to that? is going to speak because so far it's all female. Thank you very much for being here. Um, following on the earlier question about education cooperatives, some Occupy Boston activists are creating a cooperative center with several elements. And one element is a truly free and public and open admissions school sustained by Inca from cooperative business. And the schools can offer courses with training teachers for adult students and maybe even for credit through a relationship with a community college. And my question for both of you is, what would your dream curriculum be for such a school? Well, I'll say mine briefly, and I think anybody that's encountered me knows that I'm 
you know, I, I, I bemoan the loss of humanities in education. I think that the humanities are not only uh, where you learn, I mean, you know what, I love science and math too, that's great. But, you know, it's in the humanities that you, you learn humanity, right? You, are, you find joy and you find sorrow and you find compassion and you find um, politics and the state and your rights. And, and I think that, you know, Dr. Chomsky was talking about, um, you know, the literature habits of the working class of the past. And um, I really can't emphasize enough how sad it is that this has been lost, right? Um, so, you know, if you, if you have great literature, it, it makes you think about the ways that we treat each other and, and the ways that we want to be treated and, and the ways that we feel, right? Um, and I don't, you know, I sound like a I'm waxing romantic girl up here, but at the end of the day, like romance and love is, is enriching in our life. And who wants to create a world where that's not celebrated and that's not what we spend our time on? Um, so to me, education is a way to find more of that. And, and I think, um, you know, any curriculum that would teach people how to, you know, find these, these sources that are going to make them enjoy their life more and make their life more um, enriched on a, on a personal, you know, philosophical, spiritual, emotional level um, is, what, is what is needed. And I also think that if, if, if you really pinned it down, what the ideal for curriculum for any class would be would, would be a dialogue. It wouldn't be with what I want the class to be. It would be what the class wants to be, right? So it would be a cooperative um, within the cooperative. And I think Dr. Chomsky, here you are. Well, you know, th th this is a question that goes back hundreds of years. Uh, you go back to the Enlightenment again, there were sort of two views of education which were contrasted. Uh, there was an, kind of an imagery used. The, the one image is that education is like a, a, a vessel into which you pour water. And it's, of course, a very leaky vessel, as you all know from having been through the experience. The other is uh, uh, that education is like uh, a string the teacher lays out a string along which the student progresses in their own way, uh, going where they want. Uh, so there's some, kind of, there's some kind of framework. And then within that framework, uh, children, adults, whatever it is, go and explore. I think that's pretty much the way science, a graduate science teaching is done. Uh, but it can go down to kindergarten. Uh, and it can be in the humanities, and literature can be in the sciences. So I'll just give you one example of a successful program uh, for kindergarten kids. Uh, instead of teaching them to you know, memorize the periodic table, which is totally meaningless, or you know, to learn Boolean algebra, or whatever it would be, the program that was carried out successfully for five-year-olds, uh, they were given the task of, uh, they were, each, each kid was given a dish in which there were uh, seeds, pebbles, and shells. And their task was to figure out which ones were the seeds. So the first thing they did was have what was called a scientific conference. The kids all got together and uh, exchanged ideas about how you would determine which is a seed. And then they tried out their ideas. And some of them didn't work, and some of them did work. And it went on, and it finally ended up at the end of the, this class group was uh, uh, where they were given uh, magnifying glasses and were dissect they'd figured out what the seeds were and were dis dissecting the seeds and looking for the embryo inside that's the source of nutrition. Okay, those kids learned something. I'll give you an example from sixth grade history. This is a friend of mine, sixth grade history teacher. Uh, the, uh, they were getting to the point where they were studying the American Revolution. So what she did was, uh, for a couple of weeks, she started acting extremely arbitrary in class, you know, forcing the kids to do things they didn't want to do, and uh, so on. And they got kind of, you know, restless, and finally there was kind of like a revolution going on in class. At that point, she introduced the American Revolution. <laughs> okay, they understood it. Uh, you can do this on, in anything, and it really doesn't matter that much, I don't think, what the topic is. If you learn how to discover and search and inquire, 
So that can carry on through your life. Uh, if you learn a particular domain, it might be interesting, but it doesn't leave you with much. Okay, great. So we have two more folks on the stack. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to everybody. We want to respect our panelists' time and our agenda. So, Sylvia? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for having me to see it. Um, this is like beyond my wildest dreams. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I just want to ask um, actually a question kind of going towards both of you. Um, both Samantha and Ryan, you talked about the Supreme Court case and how it was kind of like a very specific case to the Supreme Court. How do you think uh, we can use language to kind of effectively convey our issues with these systems um, in a way that doesn't? Um, cause people to equate our sort of can you, can you, um, our uh, movement with movements that have been so successful in the past. Um, I think the idea is how, um, from a, she's from a linguistic and historical perspective, how can we, like, how can Dr. Chomsky, would you like that repeated? Yeah, what? when do we like, she can repeat better probably. Oh, I, I we can't hear very well through a microphone, so. I am very nope. sorry. Um, oh. How can we use language uh, to effectively convey our issues with the system that we're kind of bound within as students um, without equating ourselves or kind of drawing uh, people's memories of unsuccessful movements in the past? How can we move beyond that um, for our you know, purposes? Thank you. So how can she use, like, how can they use language to sort of um, prevent the move to articulate their goals without being associated with unsuccessful movements in the past with the system. Well, you know, uh, language is kind of a neutral instrument. Depends how you use it. I mean, there are traps. Like every, just about every word that's used for in social and political discourse has two meanings. Uh, it has its literal meaning and a meaning that's used for political warfare, which is often quite different. Uh, and that's true of everything. Sometimes it's quite interesting. Uh, so take, say, the notion person, a fundamental notion. It's very interesting to see the way that's evolved in American law up to the present uh, and used in a way which, in, which is highly significant right now. So you go back to the Magna Carta, it says all free men have certain rights, you know, jury trial, uh, 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 do, what we call due process and so on. Well, a couple centuries later that was expanded to free people. Uh, when it crosses the Atlantic uh, and enters the constitutional system, it was modified again. It's, uh, it's uh, free white men, okay? so. Blacks are out, and of course the indigenous population are out. They have no rights, exterminate them. And women were out. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, it wasn't until 1975 that even had a guarantee to be on jury trial. Couldn't vote till the 1920s and so on. Uh, so it was um, a person, the, 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 uh, the Fifth Amendment says no person shall be deprived of rights, you know, without due process. But it didn't mean the indigenous population, it didn't mean Blacks. Uh, it didn't mean Native Americans. It didn't even mean it didn't mean women, and it didn't even mean poor men, because you had to you know you had poll taxes and various kinds of restrictions. Uh, uh, when you get to the Fourteenth Amendment, the word has changed. It's expanded. It's again the same phrase. You know, no person shall be deprived of rights. Uh, it ex it technically included freed slaves, but that was only technical. But within a couple of years, they were back in slavery after Reconstruction, but uh, at least technically it did. I mean, they didn't even formally get rights for another century, 1960s. Still excluded women, uh, uh, but it was expanded, as you all know, over the next century to include corporations. So without going through the history, when you get up to the present, you look at the recent Supreme Court cases, they both expand and restrict the notion person. It's expanded to include corporations now have rights way beyond human, you know, pe people of flesh and blood. It's also restricted. 
It's restricted to ex explicitly to exclude undocumented aliens. They cannot, they don't fall in the category of persons. Supreme Court has repeatedly uh, uh, ruled on this over the years. I think the latest is Russell v. Rumsfeld, very recent. They're not persons. Uh, they don't have the right of free speech. They don't have any of the uh, rights in the Bill of Rights because they're not persons. Uh, they're what uh, George Orwell called unpeople, meaning kind of look like people, but it's superficial. They're, they're not people. Well, that's the word person. Well, you go to any other word that's used, and of course it becomes ridiculous. Uh, take, say, a terrorist. A terrorist, that's an interesting term. Uh, became particularly interesting since Reagan. Reagan came into office declaring a war on terror. The uh, core issue in policy has to be a struggle against international terrorism and so on. Well, uh, that, uh, the question is, what's terrorism? Well, there happens to be a definition in the US code and in the British law uh, and in army manuals, but you can't use that definition. I've been writing about terror ever since then. I use that definition, but it's out of the canon because if you use that definition, it immediately follows that the United States is one of the leading terrorist uh, sources of terror in the world. Okay, that won't work. So an academic discipline has developed of terrorism studies, you know, academic conferences, uh, uh, big books, uh, you know, professional departments, trying to find a definition of the word terror which will meet the crucial condition that it excludes what we do to them and includes what they do to us. And it's tricky. Uh, so you get the way terrorist is used now without discussion is pretty shocking. So uh, for example, Nelson Mandela was on the terrorist list until about two years ago. Uh, and the reason was because Reagan was supporting apartheid. So therefore, the ANC was one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. Uh, uh, there's one, a case, the first case to come to what's called trial under Obama from Guantanamo, a military court, of course. Now, the first case was Omar Khadr. Now, take, a, take a look at it on the internet. Omar Khadr is a 15-year-old child whose crime was to try to defend his village when it was attacked by American soldiers in Afghanistan. So he spent eight years in Bagram and Guantanamo, and you know what that's like. Uh, then he came to trial. He was given two choices, either plead guilty and you have another eight years, or plead innocent and you stay here for the rest of your life. Uh, okay, he pleaded guilty, now he's got another eight years. That's a terrorist who has to be imprisoned for 16 years under hideous conditions because he tried to defend his village, his own village, when it was attacked by American soldiers. And try to find anyone who even bats an eyelash over this. It's not even discussed. Well, okay, that's terror. And you just go down the list and it's the same. Actually, one of the interesting words in the last 20 years really has been uh, jobs. The, the phrase, you, there's a word you're not allowed to pronounce in the United States. It's a dirty word, I'll spell it. P-R-O-F-I-T-S. That's unpronounceable. Uh, the way you pronounce it is jobs, it's literally. So you, you hear it all over now, the job creators, meaning the profit creators, they don't produce jobs. And that's uh, across the board. And uh, of course you have to get out of these traps. But it's, you can perfectly well understand it. Those are means of uh, uh, ideological control. Well, uh, unfortunately, that's all the questions we can take now. We really apologize for all the people that we were taking down staff, but in the interest of time and finishing the rest of the summit and then the respect for our speakers, we're going to conclude our Q&A session. So if I could get a really big, warm round of applause for <laughs> Thank you.